Hello and welcome to this webinar. This is the second in a series showcasing the benefits of substituting hazardous chemicals and the tools and resources available to assist you. My name is Denis Motet and I work for the Risk Management Implementation Unit here at ECA and I will be your moderator today. More and more companies are conscious about the impact that their activities can have on human health and the environment. This can be one reason, among others, for industries to look closer at the raw material they use, their production processes, and the products they manufacture to identify if harmful chemicals could be replaced. In complex supply chains like the textile sector, identifying substances involved in the manufacturing processes can already be a challenge. Finding and implementing safer alternatives, which ensure similar technical performance while being cost-effective, is another one. In today's webinar, you will hear about the experience of a large textile retailer that has already been active for many years in replacing harmful chemicals. You will also hear the story of a group of small manufacturing companies from the north of Italy who have joined forces with the same substitution goal. You will also get an overview of tools that two NGOs provide to companies in their substitution project. The European Textile Sector Association will inform you of the way they support their members replacing harmful chemicals. We encourage you to submit your questions at any time through the Q&A panel, which should be visible in your webinar window. In addition to ECA staff, you will have the five presenters from today ready to answer your questions. Please select the All Panelist options when submitting your questions. If you want to address questions to specific speakers, mention their name at the start of the question. Note that the presenters will answer in their own capacity and do not represent the official position of ECA. You can submit your questions until the end of the webinar. Please monitor the Q&A panel and remain logged in to the webinar until you get your answer. We expect many questions and may, may not be able to answer all of them. If your question is not answered, you can send it to us using our contact form. If you experience any technical difficulties, you can contact our technical support team through the Q&A panel or by email. The webinar will be recorded and published on our website. A link to all the material will be sent to you as soon as they are available. Mr. Moras Kalia from the European Textile Association Euratex will share some of the concrete actions their members are taking to move away from substances of concern. Mr. Scalia, please go ahead. So, um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, ECA, for this opportunity. Um, thanks mostly also to choose the topic of this uh, webinar, replacement of hazardous chemical and textiles, which is very, very relevant for us. I'm Mauro Scalia. I'm head of the Sustainable Businesses Department in Eurotex, which is the European uh, Textile and Clothing Industry Confederation. So uh, we represent the European textile and clothing manufacturers, uh, which produce mostly in Europe and are integrated in the global supply chain, of course. And here I give a, a glimpse of our industry. It's a large uh, manufacturing industry, uh, 1.7 million workers, uh, 174,000 companies, which as you can see uh, from the uh, bottom right corner, it is dominated by small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, that's actually something which is not very much known or, or acknowledged as a public knowledge um, that about 80% of this uh, large industry, it's um, maybe companies with less than 10 employees, which is very relevant also for the topic we're going to discuss. And the whole sector generates almost 170 billion of uh, euro of turnover. So it's very sizable. And it is a small and medium sized based industry. It's a very diverse industry. And here I also wanted to offer a glimpse, uh, let's say, an infographic about uh, how it is widespread across Europe uh, in a very different manner. 
um, textile and clothing um, from fibers to the finished products has different application. You have some countries, you take Germany, for instance, uh, which produce a lot of technical textiles, which are textiles um, chosen for performances, not, for instance, for fashion trends. Uh, one out of four of those made in Europe are made in Germany. Uh, Austria is leader in fibers, cellulosic visor based fibers producer. Um, Italy, many other countries are very strong in clothing production, in addition to technical textiles. So it's very, very diverse. And that's also another point to be taken into account. Um, I have only a few minutes and I wanted to share a few insights um, on a specific case on replacement of hazardous chemicals uh, in which we worked uh, with our members, which perhaps I shall stress are the National Textile and Clothing Federation. Um, this is about a replacement of PFOA um, and it's a very sensitive subject in uh, many aspects of the clothing industry. Um, we started to look at that uh, in collaboration with the European Union institutions, where the European Commission and the other stakeholders launched the process to restrict um, PFOA, to enter PFOA in 2017 uh, last year. And at the end of last year, the European Commission made a final proposal in which acknowledged uh, the need to provide certain derogation of time um, to allow the industry to adjust its manufacturing processes um, to comply with certain uh, with specific uh, safety standard requirements. And that is for us a very relevant point, which I think it's also inspiring uh, the discussion about chemical replacement. Um, so we look at clothing, uh, personal protective equipment or technical textiles. Basic question is, are they all the same? The answer is clearly no. There are textile products which are chosen for fashion trends, other for uh, performances. When you look at restricting or how PFOA shall be replaced, uh, you have to look, we had to look at the performances of the um, products, textile products. And uh, we collect information, we work a lot with our members, we work with companies to understand what are the limits, what can be done with what kind of chemicals how changing a certain recipe would influence the other recipe, uh, the rest of the performances in the chemical product. And that was a very complex process. It took a lot of time and a lot of efforts to our members and our companies. Um, eventually, like I say, the final proposal was positive for the derogation. We hope this will be confirmed in the next steps of the legislative process. And we're already working on how this time derogation shall be used. Uh, and that's, I think, a crucial point that I would like to highlight here. Um, the time is used to basically boost the link between research and um, the result of research in a manner which can be used by those 100 plus thousand companies that I mentioned in my previous slides. Um, we do see that there is a need to go on the case by case based on certain application to see what the impact of replacing a certain components will be in the overall recipe and the overall products. Uh, we have a very specific case um, which is made in collaboration with a project with I quote here it's the Midworth project uh, which is uh, run by other organization independent from us. Uh, we came across because of mutual interest in replacement of PFOA and so in exactly uh, a couple of weeks, we're going to have a workshop in, in Spain where we're going to put together um, experts from across Europe, from industry, from research organizations, some small and medium sized enterprises. And we're going to discuss the result of this project and the result of other projects all across Europe um, to help companies in do replacement of chemicals in their actual premises, production premises. And we think this is a very successful approach towards the full replacement of uh, these chemicals. It starts by acknowledging the difference between different types of textile products. It then goes on to look at the different requirements for products and how you can actually make those. And then it goes looking at what options the current technologies uh, give to different types of companies. Because you might be a large industry with millions and millions of euro budget to do research. But you might be a smaller company, still with 100 people perhaps, uh, which produce, let's say, uniforms for firefighters and which need to use certain chemicals. In that case, the replacement has to be carefully done. 
Um, and that brings me to my last basically slide and final considerations. Uh, we all know that one size does not fit all approach is what has to be used also in this regard to avoid uh, wrong choices. We need to keep this into account in practical terms when we do make choices, whether uh, we are sort of uh, legislative bodies or lawmakers or whether we are other support organizations. We have just mentioned the case of PFOA. We are also aware of other cases of solvents, uh, which have already some promising results in being replaced um, in some textile manufacturing processes. And we want to look at the details to see how this can be extended. In doing this, we want to avoid the manufacturing companies, which are indeed our members, um, to get stuck in the middle. So you have on the one side requirements from customer and consumers. Um, on the other side, you have suppliers and the recipe that you mix and you handle to uh, deliver certain products. And you need to make sure that the two, these two elements do not pull you in different and opposite direction. So for instance, um, the standard requirements from the customer or from, from safety standards, for instance, would ask you performances, which changes in um, the chemicals would not allow you. In which case we go back to the point I made before. Uh, we believe we need to collaborate with the concerned, with the relevant uh, people, uh, whether this is a research laboratory, whether this is a uh, chemical supplier, of course. Um, we need to collaborate. We need to have a very strong collaboration on the ground um, to make sure that the, um, the placement is, can be applicable um, in different products and in different uh, product ranges. And this, of course, takes time. Um, but we believe that it's the best and the only way to avoid uh, regrettable substitution, which is a bad concept, but it's actually what we have to avoid as well, while going to the uh, direction of full replacement. So um, I would stop here. I'm, of course, happy to take any questions uh, at the later stage or also, of course, in the process of this webinar. Again, thanks very much, uh, Eka, for choosing this subject um, of how to replace, about replacement in general of hazardous chemical and textile products. We believe this is a key asset also um, for our industry, especially European manufacturers that invest in this um, replacement. And we look forward to, to have further even webinar like this one, a further occasion to work also with the other panelists which are present here today and uh, with the people from the audience in this direction. So thank you very much. I will now introduce Mr. Yannick Vicker from Greenpeace, who will present their detox campaign, which aims at help companies initiate a substitution program. Several companies have joined this campaign and Mr. Vicker will show us what the result looks like so far. Hello everyone, I'm Yannick Vicker from Greenpeace. I first want to express my thankfulness to the European Chemicals Agency for allowing me to present our campaign, Detox My Fashion. It's a global campaign designed to stimulate elimination and substitution of hazardous chemicals in the textile production chain. Uh, in the wake of adoption of REACH, the EU chemical legislation in 2006, Greenpeace initiated uh, several projects directed towards downstream users of chemicals, in particular the electronic sector and the textile sector, with uh, the meaning the objective to accelerate and anticipate the implementation of REACH. So why textiles? Uh, the textile sector uses in this production chain a great variety of chemicals and is considered a high-risk industry regarding uses and releases of hazardous chemicals. Across the world, and even in EU, the compliance with law is not enough to prevent water pollution, exposure of workers, and contamination of products. <clears throat> Our detox campaign uh, focuses on most hazardous substances those falling under the SVHC definition in REACH, the um, substances of very high concern. So it applies an approach based on 
proactive, preventive, and precautionary action, right to know, and producers' accountability and responsibility. Um, of course, like in all um, uh, Greenpeace campaign, we start with a phase of public awareness, raising public awareness. So we've been testing and exposing toxic pollution in the global production chain of textiles. Um, and um, yes, yeah, sorry, some naming and shaming uh, and uh, a comparative assessment tool we call the catwalk, uh, like in fashion, um, helped us get big brands motivated, <laughs> then engage and signing a detox commitment to eliminate toxic chemicals by 2020. Um, and from there, from that, the the, the dialogue with companies uh, gets very uh, constructive and is based in um, uh, assessing the implementation of the commitment. So the crucial piece of the detox commitment consists in drawing and adopting a manufacturing restricted substances list, aka MRSL, Together with the restriction, Restricted Substances List, the RSL, it's the main leverage tool on chemical management across the supply chain. So it, what it is, it sets a blacklist of hazardous chemicals to implement proactive, preventive, and precautionary action at manufacturer level. So informing on bans and timelines for phase out towards the 2020 goal of elimination of all hazardous chemicals across your supply chain. And it helps you monitor and control inputs, the, the chemical formulation and outputs, wastewater, sludge, products, and so on. Um, a particular attention is given to the detection limits and the reporting limits. Uh, so for us, uh, when we say zero toxics, we do mean zero, and zero means not detectable by current technology. So that's a part, a big part also of the assessments, um, the evaluation we, we have of um, one company's MRSL. Um, here you can see uh, this decision tree, the explanation of our methodology, the, the methodology we advocated to brands to derive their own MRSL. So um, it has to be clear, systematic and transparent. Uh, in this case, it can be reproducible and adaptable to other sectors as well. Uh, we are doing the same with electronics. So it translates the spirit of existing laws and international conventions and helping us to put um, uh, an initial focus on 11 priority groups of hazardous chemicals. And you can see here the uh, regional convention we use to draw that. And here, the 11 priority chemical groups uh, derived from that. I, I let you discover um, this later on at home. And this uh, um, methodology to extend beyond the 11 priority groups use a uh, hazard screening tool. In our case, we have advocated and pushed for the green screen um, list translator, which is one of the best tools we found um, available for everyone to do that work. Um, this is um, behind the, the hazard screening tool. Uh, there has to be res respect of nine crucial principles. I'm not going to detail them right now, but I want to stress the, the main point, which is we push uh, for hazard-based um, uh, methodology and with the exclusion of all risk-based criteria uh, at this stage, because the idea is to have an ambitious, broad plan towards the 2020 goal. Um, on, on top of the, um, the MRSL, we ask also companies to uh, perform annual check tests on raw wastewater and to disclose them on the PRTR platform, a public register um, uh, sorry, a pollution register and, and, and transfer registry, which is run by IPE, uh, which is a, an NGO, a Chinese NGO. Why we do that? Uh, to give um, 
I, I put there three, three adjectives, tangible, educational, influential. Tangible because we want to see results, concrete results of the action uh, of the implementation of the MRSL and be able to measure uh, the progress. Educational because it gets suppliers um, really involved into chemical management, into monitoring, into inventory, everything that goes around it with the brands, um, with the labs as well. And influential because uh, this is a public database in the end where all these results are published. And it gives also a political message to public authorities uh, for China, it was a very important and <clears throat> it's delivering uh, some influence um, difficult, <laughs> let's say, but uh, it definitely is being watched by uh, the Chinese authorities. Um, also, um, on another aspect is the growing trend we have helped push forward is the disclosure of the suppliers list. It's a step towards uh, stable relationships. We can have a lot of benefits, of course, first for the detox implementation, but also uh, the long-term engagement in improving chemical management with the supplier and uh, the leverage you need to also solve human rights and social issues. Uh, the last pillar of our detox program is the, the substitution uh, case studies themselves. And we have focused on two post shy chemicals, the alkyl phenols and perforated chemicals, um, which are um, substances which are persistent and bioaccumulative and have um, a lot of great variety of hazardous um, properties. So we ask company to uh, set phase out timelines, uh, ambitious, and to publicly share the in some investigation on the statu quo at the start of the of the program and until the achievement of substitution in the end documented by a case study that we ask them to publish on the subsport platform um, just to attract your attention to this particular case where we work with the subsector of um, outdoor gears and we had this very recent uh, victory. Um, what have we done here? We, uh, through documentation of uh, pollution uh, um, of uh, outdoor spaces like high mountains, uh, we've documented contamination by PFCs of high mountains across the globe. We managed to mobilize the, the outdoor lovers who themselves turned to their favorite brands and push them to do something about it. And the other brands at their turn, turn to Gore-Tex, uh, Gore which is the leader of this uh, um, <clears throat> waterproof um, technology. And we agreed very recently to uh, adopt a new technology without PFCs of environmental concern into um, their process. So, all in all, after six years of campaign, it's almost 80 detox committed companies. And I just want to stress uh, the very different size of company. Of course, we are evaluating uh, the global fashion leaders, big brands, uh, but we have also SMEs uh, from Italy, from Lithuania um, involved in, in this. We have these smaller brands like outdoor brands, and we have um, retailers and discounters from Germany as well. So very, very different type of business um, and very different size, all capable to deliver change uh, on the basis of this uh, uh, MRSL focused program. So just to uh, leave you with some a few lessons learned from this campaign, um, definitely uh, for you downstream users of chemicals, we really um, push you to uh, adopt an hazard-based approach um, and no risk-based criteria because uh, you will um, arbitrarily um, shrink the scope of your action. So um, to create change, the MRSL approach requires a broad scope. Uh, it requires ambitious timelines and low reporting limits, as, as I said before. Collective action is useful, uh, can be very useful, you can share tools, but uh, I really want to stress that uh, in doing so, 
the collective should share and endorse best practices rather than seek for the lowest common denominator, <clears throat> what we have witnessed before. Uh, you need to involve chemical supplier, you need to involve labs also, as well as, of course, suppliers. And uh, you have to think broadly about substitution. Uh, substitution is also about abandoning, considering that functionality is not that important compared to the harm it does to the environment and the people, and you could just consider abandoning it or change it. So it's not unless on, on, on the chemical level. For uh, policymakers, because we are hosted by ICA, I just want to pass this message. Yes, we need more bans restrictions and faster and, uh, and um, <clears throat> forward in this uh, process of uh, implementation of reach, but also at UNEP level when it is necessary, uh, for example, for PFCs. And products policies, and I think uh, particular of the restriction, current discussion on the restriction of CMRs in textile can also help. Uh, but if you want to help from the consumers and you need to put the limits so low enough that it can impact the production chain as well and deliver change in the production chain. Uh, beyond the legal requirements, the MRSL approach is a very good tool to accelerate the movement of substitution, of voluntary substitution. And uh, we think at Greenpeace that it should be rewarded by some um, EPR, extended producer responsibility package um, that could really help. And last message, we definitely desperately need um, a database with substitution case studies and, and safer alternatives available for everyone to use. Uh, we've been using Subsport so far, uh, but it's an NGO-funded project and we need more capacity for this. Thank you very much for your attention. I left some uh, useful links you will find um, in my presentation uh, showing uh, some examples of uh, MRSL from companies um, and uh, some of the reports or the partner NGOs that we work with in this campaign. <music>My name is Ilva Weisbach, and uh, I work with chemical management at H&M. Um, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present how we work with chemicals. So today I'm going to talk about uh, some general facts of H&M, and then I will go into detail about uh, our chemical management and specifically focus on how we identify substances of concern and how we engage with our supply chain. I will also uh, explain uh, about how we phased out PFCs and tell you a little bit about uh, our cooperation with the CDHC group and also uh, some of the challenges that we face as a brand with chemical management. Fashion and quality at the best price in a sustainable way is the business concept of H&M. And uh, it all started with one store in uh, a Swedish small town called Westeros. Today we have more than 4,000 stores in 64 markets and uh, 148,000 employees safe products produced in a healthy workplace while protecting the environment. This is uh, the chemical vision of H&M. So how do we reach this vision? First of all, we have a precautionary approach in our chemical management. And one of the important things that we ask ourselves is what function is needed? Does this overall, for example, in the picture, need to be oil and blood repellent? Uh, we hope not. And uh, therefore, 
we can avoid some of the hazardous chemicals that are connected to functional finishes and fluorocarbons. We also do not allow antibacterial treatment for the same reason. We see no need for that function in, in our everyday wear. One foundation for our chemical management is our restricted substance lists that uh, is taking in, into account both health for customers, workers and for the environment. As a minimum, it is based on laws and regulation in each of our selling countries. However, legislation seldom targets our product types. So in many cases, we apply legislation uh, for, other product type, for other product types on our assortment. An, ex an example of that is the phthalate restriction for childcare, artic childcare articles. We apply that restriction on our whole assortment. And that way we avoid hazardous phthalates in, for example, prints on t-shirts, etc. We also have a manufacturing restricted substance list, which focuses, focuses more on the factory itself and not so much on the final product. Our goal here is to have clean factories without, for example, the use of organic solvents, etc. These are substances that are more difficult to detect in, in final products and easier to restrict at the site. And all our chemical restrictions are publicly available uh, if you click on the link below. So how do we identify which substances to restrict in, in these lists? Uh, we, we often look at the SIN list for what substances are about to be restricted. This is a good tool for us. We also look at scientific reports and information from authorities, such as the Swedish Chemicals Agency. And as I said, legislation often targeting other product, products can be, be applied also on our, on our product range. Another method that we use is the green screen list translator. Uh, this is a list of lists uh, that we apply in order to uh, identify substances for our manufacturing restricted substance list. So how do we then engage with our supply chain about all of this? First of all, we have a supplier portal, which is um, a database where we put all our information regarding chemicals and whenever we add something new, our suppliers will get uh, an email with that information. As you see, here is also a map and this map shows all the countries where H&M is producing. And the dots are where we have production offices. In each of these offices, we have chemists hired uh, and their competence is very important in, in our work. For example, they perform risk assessments on each order that we place. Um, this means, for example, that they will uh, look into what kind of order we're placing and look into what kind of chemical risks might be associated with that type of product. The supplier then has to show us evidence uh, that this risk has been eliminated. The chemists in production offices also do training with our suppliers and help them in case of failure to do a root cause analysis. We also do random testing in order to make sure that we really get the product that we, are, that we pay for. Apart for that, of that, we do uh, our suppliers do self-assessment regarding their, ke their chemical management, which we in turn verify. We have also identified that it can be quite difficult for males, etc., to find out and to learn about uh, chemical risks. So therefore we're working together with SGS on hazardous control training.
another way of engaging with our supply chain is engaging directly with our chemical supplier or material supplier. And here are a few examples of that. For example, we have developed PU without the solvent DMF in close co collaboration with Bayer Material Science. We have also developed options to solvent and water-based glues with thermoglues and Henkel. We also do trainings with our suppliers and chemical suppliers. For example, when it comes to finding alternatives to formaldehyde, this has been a good option. Uh, and here is an example of how we engaged with a chemical supplier in order to find alternative functional finishes. Uh, we started in 2009 to cooperate with a chemical supplier uh, with a water repellent finish without fluorocarbons. Uh, we then did a first trial, which was successful. And uh, in 2010, our first winter overalls for kids uh, was introduced to the market. And in 2013, we were able to restrict fluorocarbons in, in all our products. And at the same time, we also published pos positive lists uh, with approved PFC-free functional finishes. And here is also a link to that list if anyone is interested. This is a continuous improvement and development. And today um, we are really looking for a better routine in order to appoint safer alternatives. Until now, we've had an internal routine. Uh, but now we are more and more investigating other options. Therefore, our positive lists are currently on hold. We also cooperate with the CDHC group, uh, which is uh, many brands and suppliers working together on MRSL conformity and update, audit protocol, data and disclosure, wastewater, and training. And one of the things that CDHC Group is now about to release is a database for chemicals fulfilling the CDHC MRSL. It is called the CDHC Chemical Gateway, and it is a database on safer textile and leather chemistry. And the main function is to create a shopping list for CDHC MRSL approved chemicals. And there are three different levels of disclosure for the chemicals registered in the gateway, from level zero to level three. Level zero is basically the SDS, safety data sheet information, and a self declaration from the chemical suppliers whereas level two and three also involves third-party assessment. And these third-party assessments, I think, are really important because it's a big challenge for us as a brand to get that from on the alternatives that we use. Many chemical suppliers can, can provide us with a safety data sheet and with, even with scientific reports but they cannot give us any standardized information about uh, that their alternative is actually safer to use than something else. And in many cases, the safety data sheet that they can provide us with is not uh, enough information. Often the requirements that we have on our final products is much stricter than the requirements for an SDS and what information you have to provide. Basically, the SDS, I think, is made in order for storing and transporting chemicals, not for reaching zero discharge, like we are aiming to. So, in short, what, is, uh, what function is needed is a very important question to ask. A lot of, chem of hazardous chemicals can be avoided by asking this simple question. 
Also, in-house competence is very helpful in order to have a good contact with your supply chain. And a stepwise approach, like for example, starting to restrict the hazardous substance in children's wear is a good start. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Weisbach, for your interesting presentation on how a large firm with many suppliers and products can tackle the substitution challenge. Next, Mr. Andrea Franke, representing the Confinestria Toscana North, will present why more than 20 small companies joined forces to eliminate harmful chemicals and how they work together in practice. Hi everybody, I am Andrea Franchi, uh, the chemical manager of Buzzi Lab in Prato. I'm very glad to speak at this webinar and I hope you find this presentation very interesting. Today, I'd like to share with all of you our experience in Prato Textile District concerning the detox approach and some case study regarding substitution of chemical substances. First, let me have a brief presentation about Prato Textile District. Textile industry in Prato began in early 12th century. Now Prato is renowned for a special te textile article called Cardato, a woolen fabric obtained by short fiber, and for Cardato Regenerato, the same woolen article obtained by reused and recycled yards. Beside carbon and regenerated carbon fabrics, Prato District now produces a large variety of, of articles such as synthetic fools and leathers, technical and special fabrics, knitwear and non woven fabric, with almost 60% of turnover sells abroad in more than 140 foreign countries. Significance of Prato to Italian export is about 15%. And at the moment, Prato is the largest Italian textile district with more than 300,000 employees. Sustainability was present in the district since origins. The, the, the technique of regenerated fabric, the so-called Caldato Regenerato, allows a high recovery of waste fiber and yarns that normally are thrown away. This way of recycling affords a large environmental sustainability in terms of water consumption and carbon dioxide emission. Furthermore, Prato is the only textile district in Europe that have a centralized wastewater treatment plant. The upcoming water of all the textile industries in the district are carried out into WWTP, purified and recycled back to the industry. This particular situation permits to reuse about 5 million cubic meters of water every year. It means that about 40% of industrial water is recycled water. So, with a long tradition of sustainability and recycling, why Prato District joined detox campaign? Well, there are many reasons. In the last years, more and more important customer of luxury and fashion brand of our textile district claim an increasing demand of sustainability among the entire supply chain. This demand led us to reflect how an innovative and modern textile district ex Prato can afford the solution. Because of many companies in the district still were involved in a sustainability process since many years, CTN made many efforts to improve the knowledge about sustainability in the entire district. And so, in early 2016, CTN announced its subscription to Detox campaign. This was the first textile district in the world that subscribed a collective detox commitment. Within February and March 2016, 27 manufacturing companies of Prato District endorsed the detox commitment. Now, take a look at this video of Mr. Andrea Cavicchi, the president of CTN, that showed the reason for joining detox campaign. Prima come Confindustria Prato e poi successivamente come Confindustria Toscana Nord abbiamo pensato di aderire alla campagna Detox soprattutto perché da sempre c'è stata un'attenzione all'impatto delle nostre produzioni sull'ambiente e sulle acque 
tanto che già dagli anni 70 noi avevamo un, un impianto di depurazione che depurava tutte le acque a livello territoriale. Oggi noi abbiamo delle industrie che sono divise in varie fasi di lavorazione, quindi non abbiamo industrie verticalizzate, ma in tutte le fasi di lavorazione c'è il controllo a livello ambientale. Molte delle nostre aziende già lavorano con brand che hanno sottoscritto il progetto Detox e abbiamo visto che i livelli di inquinamento e di presenza di sostanze nocive erano già a livelli molto bassi o addirittura non esistenti. Però abbiamo ritenuto il territorio idoneo a, a supportare questa sfida, quindi come associazione noi abbiamo dato un grande supporto a questo progetto e abbiamo dato supporto a tutte le aziende che volevano aderire a questo, a questo progetto così importante. Ad oggi sono già diverse decine, eh, però prevedo che ci saranno altre aziende che sottoscriveranno a breve, quindi questo può essere un grande vantaggio economico e di competitività. Probabilmente questa è la strada, perché noi sosteniamo che l'industria dell'abbigliamento, dell quindi della moda, debba essere sostenibile e solo tramite un'industria sostenibile ci potrà essere un futuro di un tessile che, che lavora sui nostri territori. Quindi questo può essere anche proprio un vantaggio economico, in quanto riuscire a, a produrre il tessuto o il filato di secondo i dettami del detox potrà dargli la capacità di poter competere con altre aziende che hanno prezzi più bassi. Questo progetto sta influenzando fortemente le aziende che hanno cambiato il modo di eh, lavorare all'interno e all'esterno. Cosa vuol dire? Si stanno riorganizzando, stanno cercando di controllare tutti i processi di lavorazione e controllare i loro fornitori che la merce sia secondo i dettami del detox. Stanno cambiando anche a livello di impianti, probabilmente avremo un'influenza anche sul processo produttivo. Io credo che in, in cinque anni, a un termine medio, avremo dei grandi risultati, soprattutto sulle materie prime che verranno fornite sul nostro territorio, a livello di investimenti, a livello di adesioni su questo progetto. Io penso che da Prato partirà una vera rivoluzione industriale dal, dal punto di vista del tessile e della moda che va nella direzione della sostenibilità. Per le nostre aziende i costi della partecipazione alla Detox Revolution sono abbastanza importanti in quanto oggi dobbiamo cambiare molto del nostro modo di approcciare il, la, il processo tessile. Oggi un'industria tessile moderna non può esimersi da essere sostenibile dal punto di vista del rispetto dell'ambiente e quindi non impattare sul proprio territorio più del dovuto e soprattutto essere sostenibile anche dal punto di vista etico. Ma la cosa più importante è quindi il vantaggio che potremo trovare questa sostenibilità che potrà essere proprio un vantaggio anche economico per le nostre imprese. Il nostro è un territorio appunto caratterizzato da una filiera produttiva con piccole imprese che fanno delle, semi, delle lavorazioni all'interno di un processo di lavorazione molto complesso. Coordinarle, metterle insieme, fare formazione, far sì che il progetto fosse univoco è stato un impegno molto forte per la nostra associazione, è stato gestito in maniera coordinata, però oggi ci ritroviamo un'esperienza unica che può essere anche eh, messa a disposizione di altri territori che vogliono affrontare il progetto in maniera seria e approfondita come lo stiamo facendo noi a Prato. Direi prima di tutto mettersi in contatto con noi per cercare di far sì che la nostra esperienza possa essere anche utile per loro, per non fare errori magari già percorsi da altre associazioni o anche fatte sul nostro territorio. Eh, cercare di, di approcciare questo progetto con, con fiducia, perché noi crediamo che la sostenibilità vada in questa direzione e proprio il progetto Detox possa essere il futuro del tessile e della moda del mondo e anche far sì che gli imprenditori siano trasparenti, facciano una tracciabilità vera delle proprie lavorazioni e che questo diventi un grande cavallo di battaglia anche proprio per il territorio, come chiave di comunicazione di un territorio che ha voglia di cambiare, che ha voglia di lavorare in maniera diversa. Credo sia una grande sfida che un'associazione tessile può affrontare con, con fiducia e con coraggio. Then, company of district found the CID, Italian Consortium for Implementing Detox Approach. On its part, what CID assures technical support for every member, even from obtaining environmental or ethic issues, 
promote R&D project for implementing efficiency of production processes, promote any sustainability activity of the company. For Prato District, CID is the way to organize the single company. Seed Roadmap will expect new case study regarding identification of substances of concern in many different articles with aim of chemical analysis and subsequent searching for alternative substances with the help of suppliers, vendors and customers. So, let's talk about some practical tips made by CTM and CID regarding chemical substitution of dangerous substances. Uh, just a brief introduction. At the moment, for an European co company that uses chemical substances in any stage of production, the main source of information for a chemical safety is material safety data sheet. In many cases, however, MSDS is not sufficient. Moving to detox approach, company needs to know all the contaminants that could be present in a chemical formulation, even if intentional or not intentional use, and also in a very low concentration. So, if on a hand it's essential to establish a new way of work between manufacturing companies and chemical producers, in order to exchange much information as possible for correct application of M of MRSL. On the other hand, in order to have a complete check of chemical safety, the only way at the moment is to perform chemical analysis. So, the first example regarding a case study for a chemical substitution of perfluorinated compound, PFC. First, at the sign of detox commitment in February 2016, CTM and GIDA, the company that, that managed the WWTP, signed an agreement for a long period of planning for chemical analysis of recycled water. Also, Dying Mills perform chemical analysis on their input and output water, while chemical suppliers perform chemical analysis on their chemical formulation and on finished garment. Then, when planning a chemical substitution of PFC, maybe the most challenging topic is to guarantee that the same performance in terms of water repellency before and after washing respect to a PFC treated article. Complete study, co uh, complete study can be found on the displayed link. Conclusion of this case study was that no PFC presence in the articles and in chemicals, PFC presence in outcoming water is essentially due to a presence in incoming water. Second, second example of chemical substitution was regarding ethoxylated alkyl phenols, APIOS. In this case study, Every single detox committed company started an internal check of their supply chain. So single results of each company are available on their own website. Full data is still available on CTN website. We observe that for chemicals, no significant variation of appears present presence in the last three years. While for raw materials and then for finished product, we observe a very low reduction of appeals presence in the last three years. Finally, the third example of chemical substitution regarding dyestuffs. CID promoted a case study for evaluation of chemical contamination of dyestuffs used in textile and fashion industry, with aim to substitute the most contaminated ones. Chemical analysis was restricted to only four groups of detox MRSL, APIOS, aromatic amines, chlorophenols, and phthalate. Chemical analysis were performed by Buzzi Lab for aromatic amines. The test method is compliant to EN ISO 14362 Part 1 Annex F. Apios, chlorophenols, and phthalate were analyzed by internal method developed by Buzzi Lab using liquid chromatography high resolution mass spectrometry LC QTOF analysis. 
228 dye stuffs of different classes, for example, acid dyes, direct dyes, reactive dyes, and so on, were analyzed in the study. Comparing analytical data, data with the detox MRSL limits, we found many non-compliant results, especially for appeals and aromatic chemists. It's also interesting maybe to check the total non-compliance when comparing analytical data respect to other widely used MRSL that have a higher limits than detox MRSL. For example, the ZDHC MRSL. In this case, we observe, we observe that the total non-compliance de decreases quite to zero. This is only an example of the final report for the dye stuffs, and the full data is this are available on the display the link. Now I'm finished. If you have any question, you can contact, contact us anytime you need. Thank you very much for your attention and regards to all of you. Thank you, Mr. Franke, for your presentation. This is a good example on how SMEs can identify synergies to achieve a common goal and ensure their continued competitiveness within the EU. Now that we have heard the experience of two companies, Mr. Jerker Lickart from the International Chemical Secretariat, CHEMSEC, will present the tools they provide to textile companies to ease their work in finding su suitable substitutes. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, as mentioned, my name is uh, Jarki Lichtart, and I'm a senior chemicals advisor and product manager for the Textile Guide, which is a tool that we have developed in Chemsec in order to assist and improve chemicals management in the textile supply chain. Please feel free to email me if you have any further questions which are not answered even after the Q&A session, and I'll be happy to answer them afterwards if you get my email address in the end. But who is CHEMSEC? CHEMSEC, or the International Chemical Secretariat, is an environmental NGO, and we were founded in 2002 and are financed through grants from the Swedish government, uh, authorities, and charity funds, as well as specific product-related funding from a wide variety of sources. However, to maintain our independence, we have never accepted any money from individual companies. Further, we are not uh, targeting the general public with our work and do not run any public campaigns. Instead, we focus on policymakers and businesses. And we never do any naming and shaming of companies. Instead, we prefer to highlight positive examples. Our work can be divided into three main parts. Policy work, cooperation with companies, and business tools. In our chemicals policy work, we strive to improve chemicals regulation. In particular, we're working a lot on reach and the authorization process. But we also look beyond the EU, what is happening on the international arena. Our business work is very much directed towards improving companies' chemicals management through direct contact with all kinds of companies, from retailers, brands, to chemical producers. The business work is, of course, closely related to the third part, development of business tools to assist and guide companies' uh, work in the right direction. And the textile guide is one of these tools. Through our business work, we have developed a deeper cooperation with a number of companies in the Chemsec Business Group, featuring multinational companies such as Dell, Sony, IKEA, Adidas, Ganska, and Kingfisher, as well as organizations such as Euro and the Swedish Construction Federation. Today, we have developed four major tools with a fifth under development in order to assist companies and investors in their campus management work. Besides the textile guide, we also have, uh, have the most known uh, two of ours, the SIN list, which together with SIN similarity and SIN producers. The SIN list contains only substances identified as substances fulfilling the REACH criteria as substances of very high concern. The fifth and newest two under development right now is the Chemtech marketplace. As you can tell by the name, it will be an online marketplace for companies providing alternatives to substances of very high concern, like an eBay for safer chemicals. 
It is scheduled to be launched in March, April, and it will not only cater for alternative providers to place as described with a solution to remove substance of very high concern, but it will also allow companies searching for safer chemicals to, to describe what they are looking for to show there is an actual pool from downstream users of chemicals of safer solutions. This will be resource free of charge, and if you would be interested in placing an advertisement, don't hesitate to contact us. But now moving over to textiles. This is how we see the situation today in the textile industry. It's a lack of supply chain information and transparency. The documentation is not standardized, so companies don't know what kind of substance the suppliers are using. And sometimes the suppliers don't even know themselves because the supply chain is so long and involves so many companies. Important information hence gets lost in translation. Then at the same time, more and more companies require the suppliers to adhere to a specific MRSL, restricting the substances that can be used in actual production. And in order to be successful in this shift, you really must know what's going on in the supply chain. The solution to address these things is in theory quite simple, but in practice, it can be much more challenging. But what it boils down to is to be able to find the correct and concrete information on chemicals usage, a simple way of evaluating it and be given ideas on how to tackle the ones you don't want to have in use. Now let me tell you a bit more about the textile guide. Since textile manufacturing is a very both complex and resource intensive production process, we created this tool in order to help companies throughout the supply chain to be able to address the chemicals issue all the way from fiber to fashion through all different process and manufacturing steps and to create a website with a database that can be used by anyone in the supply chain and not, and not just something for chemical experts. So essentially what the textile guide tells you is where chemicals are used which ones that are problematic, and it gives you ideas what to do about it. And although we're very proud of the textile guide and what it can do for you, you can't expect it to solve all your chemicals management issues just like that, because each company is unique and, it, and at different knowledge levels. But what it will do, however, is to show you the way forward, provide inspiration and knowledge, and be a valuable source of information unseen in the textile world today. When you enter the website, you find the three main menus, find, evaluate, act in the top. Here we also find the direct link to the chemical database, which will now dive deeper into something I believe most of you are interested in, the database as such. When you enter the database today, you can search it, you can search it both by name or CAS number, but I strongly recommend to use the CAS number since chemicals can have many different names, but they have only one unique CAS number. If you also search just about any other substance at all, as well, since the database does not only have the 6,500 red listed hazardous chemicals in there, but also an additional 100,000 substances that have been pre-registered under reach. You can also apply three different filters, restriction lists, hazard groups such as H phrases from the COP or functional groups for different substance groups. This gives you the ability to create your own chemical inventory and you can immediately see if any of them are red listed and in that case by whom. If a substance which is not red listed today becomes so in the future, it will automatically turn red as soon as the change takes place in the database. But please remember that it's not Chemsec who has decided to red list these substances. That has been done by the organizations behind each individual list. Further, every user of the textile guide independently sets its own goal and what they want to do and what they want to achieve. The textile guide will not force you to do everything or anything for that matter. It will be up to you individually to do so. We're also working on to provide even better detailed information on the chemicals in our database. We're therefore making changes to the database, creating additional filters for specific textile fibers, process steps, as well as technical function. Considering the amount of information needed for this evolution, 
we have not yet set a date for, for its release. To be able to present this information, there needs to be something under the hood as well. We have worked hard for quite some time to gather information on these specific substances, red listed, restricted or banned by tech talk companies, but also regulatory information from the US and the EU on banned or restricted substances. And these, as you see on the screen, are the 21 lists we have chosen to include. And in combination with the different filters mentioned above, we have more than 1.2 million data points in the database. One of the key learnings from this work has been the need to consolidate the number of RSLs flying around out there. We have chosen to include a subset of the most important ones used in the textile sector. The vast number of different RSLs is actually a major obstacle for compliance. They would really need to boil down to a much smaller number, preferably one, to assist the supply chain in achieving a toxic free production. Moving over to the future, if a substance turns out to be red listed, you're probably interested in finding a better alternative that suits your process needs, your customers needs, as well as regulatory demands. We want to close the loop on chemical information all the way from chemical producer to brands. We're hence looking at the potential cooperation with the ZDC group, the zero discharge group, and their chemical gateway, which is under development by them. We intend to share data on individual substances as well as the possibility to find safer formulations by including the chemical suppliers and formulators in the process and enabling them to show what they've got and what they can do. The ultimate goal is that all actors in the supply chain should be able to check and verify formulations they're using online. And if they're not up to standards needed, you would be able to find a formulation that does. So a quick summary. The main challenge as we see it is a communication and to know what's going on in the supply chain, which holds speci specifically true for SMEs. The solution is to get a helicopter view of your products, manufacturing processes and inputs and gather all the information in one place and make it accessible for everyone in the industry, making the information standardized and available for everyone. If you can access the same information as your suppliers and your customers, you have come a long way. And this is what we're trying to achieve with the textile guide and all the other business tools we develop in Chemsec. We strongly feel that we are stronger together, so Chemsec is continuously looking for cooperation and synergies with other actors to connect our tools. And that's why we see a great opportunity in working together with CDHC and our campus gateway but we also see the need for companies and trade associations to harmonize and to use the same RSL guidelines. It's, it's like a bit squaring the circle since one RSL list will not fit everyone, but reducing the numbers will certainly help to drive the change in the supply chain. And we believe it's the best and probably the only way forward if the supply chain shall be able to comply in a cost efficient way in the long run. So thank you very much for listening. And if you would like to be kept updated on any changes and progress on the textile guide or the new Chemsec Marketplace tool, you can just sign up for our newsletter online. And you have my contact details here as promised. And thank you very much again. Thank you, Mr. Lika, for showing us these practical tools, which can certainly help industry in finding their way towards substitution. That's all the time we have for today. I hope you found the webinar useful and that these examples from the textile sector can also inspire you. Thank you to our panelists and presenters, and most of all, thank you to all of you for joining. When the webinar closes, you will be redirected to a feedback questionnaire. Please take the time to share your comments and suggestions with us so that we can develop our webinar to meet your needs. See you again in one of our upcoming webinars. Thank you and goodbye.